Okay, are we ready? All right. Almost. Okay, sounds good. Now we are. Give me just one second. <laughs> okay, all right. So, oh, good, there it is. All right. All right, take it um, away. <laughs> so, like Alex said, I am a mineral dealer, uh, born and raised in Colorado. My father came here from New Jersey in 1970. I believe it's 1970. Actually, my my dad's sister, uh, my aunt, and my uncle are somewhere in the, the chat here. They might be able to say specifically. They know probably exactly what year he came to Colorado. Anyway, with that said, he came to Colorado specifically to start mining. He was... Um, very interested in minerals like rhodochrosite, amsonite, and smoky quartz, and gold. And there was a lot more opportunity. Stupid. Oh, did I lose you guys? Hang on. Can anyone hear me? I can hear you. Okay, yes. good. Yeah. All right. So anyway, he came to Colorado because there's a lot more opportunities for mining. Um, he met quite a few people early on that helped him literally start digging things that nobody had really brought to market in a while. Um, obviously the Amazonite had been known for quite some time, but, uh, and we'll get into it shortly in the talk. He started mining the sweet home in 1977 with my grandfather, with my mom's father, specifically for specimens. And it was actually the first time anyone had ever mined the sweet home with the intention of collecting specimens. Um, and you'll, you'll see some of the pieces and the subsequent gems that came from those specimens. Um, the, the reason I decided to do a talk on the gems and some minerals of Colorado is mostly because people don't think of Colorado as a gem producing state, but we actually do have a lot of different gem material here. Um, it's typically not well marketed um and obviously we don't have things like emeralds or rubies but you're going to see a lot of interesting stuff here and unusual things things that most people don't typically associate in terms of gem material with colorado so all right let's go to the the next slide here so what we have here is some of the more famous localities in Colorado for gem material and some other iconic places. Um, top left, the Glory Hole Mine in Central City, the Crystal City Mill, Mount Antero, which we'll cover, famous for its gem aquamarines, Terriol Peak that we'll cover through here, uh, best known for the gem quality topaz. Uh, the Kelsey Lake Diamond Mine, yes, we actually have diamonds in Colorado and really good gem quality diamonds. And then some of the other uh, iconic localities in Colorado, the Yankee Girl Mill and the Cripple Creek, um, that's probably the Crescent Mine there from 1903. The reason I included that photo is um, many of you probably don't know. Uh, while my dad is the one who started the business and, and I've actually been running it full time since I was 17 years old, uh, the mining history in my family is on my mom's side. And that goes back, I'm the fifth generation of miners on her side of the family. My great, great grandfather was a tin miner in Cornwall, England. And every subsequent generation has been involved in some kind of hard rock mining or gold mining here in Colorado. So my great grandfather actually worked at Kipple, Cripple Creek at the turn of the century, and he was mining there at the age of 13. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. So here is a geological map of Colorado. You can see from border to border, it's pretty diversified. Um, the quote that I got from Bruce Geller, who was the former director of the Colorado School of Mines uh, Geology Museum is from kimberlites to pegmatites, Colorado has it all. And we'll cover every bit of that. Um, I, I, I do want to tell everyone I trimmed this talk down just a little. Uh, I didn't want it to run too long because I don't want to take up everybody's time. So we're going to cover the highlights here. There's, there's a bit more that we can go into, you know, maybe at a later date. All right, let's go to the next slide. So we're going to start with the Colorado State Gem is aquamarine, I see a typo in that paragraph, and was recognized officially as the state gemstone in 1971. The best material comes from Mount Antero. All right, number two, our state rock is Yule marble. 
And we actually didn't have an official state rock until 2004. Um, it was actually a Boy Scout troop that was able to get Yule Marble, the official state rock. Um, and that's out west um, in the Yule Creek Valley. Uh, beautiful, high quality, very pure snow white marble. Um, the Lincoln Memorial is made out of that material, which is funny because the Lincoln Memorial has been around for a long time and we didn't think to have it as our state rock. Moving on to number three, our state mineral is rhodochrosite. Makes sense. I think that's the mineral that most people think of when they think of minerals of Colorado. Um, the best known specimens of rhodochrosite come from the Sweet Home Mine, and we'll show you some of that material here. I should point out that the vast majority of stuff in this talk is pieces from our family's collection, our private collection, a lot of it collected personally by us. Okay. So despite all the minerals and gems from Colorado, gold is the primary reason that people came here. Um, if it wasn't for gold, many of the mineral and gem discoveries more than likely wouldn't have happened in Colorado when they did. Boy, another typo. I'm embarrassed to see that. Um, so Alex, let's move on to the next slide here and I'll tell everybody. Oh, here's a shot of the Lincoln Memorial. You can see all of that Yule marble from Colorado that was used for it. It's uh, like I said, very beautiful, pure white marble. You might've seen other large famous carvings from it, like the American woman that was done by Francisco Sotomayor. That was a solid piece of Yule marble as well. Okay, so next slide. The Colorado state flag actually represents all four of the items we talked about, starting with one, next slide, the aquamarine for the blue, and then we go into the white for the Yule marble, and then we have the red for rhodochrosite, and in the center, we have gold. Like I said, gold was the reason that people came here. It's interesting to note the border of Colorado was actually drawn to keep essentially the entire Colorado mineral belt within the boundaries of Colorado. We'll show you a picture of that here in just a minute, but that's why Colorado is the shape it is. They wanted to keep all of those ore bodies within Colorado uh, when the state was official in 1876. Okay, next slide. Here is our state seal of Colorado, and it actually has a pick and hammer on it. Um, not too many states recognize mining right on their state seal, but we do because it is probably the most important part of our heritage for the first 30 to 40 years of Colorado as a state. Okay, next slide. So here's a shot of the Colorado Mineral Belt. This is from the Colorado One issue of the Mineralogical Record, November, December, 1976. My dad and Hal Miller wrote this article. And you can see all the way up in the Northeast in Boulder, all the way to the Southwest um, down in Rico in Dolores County. It is essentially one contiguous string of ore deposits that runs for several hundred miles across Colorado and then deviates a bit uh, when you get down to the South across Creed in the Mineral County. Um, but you can basically just follow one ore body after another from the northeast corner to the southwest corner of Colorado. Okay. So we will start out, well, the Sweet Home Mine near Alma. Everybody's heard of the Sweet Home. My dad and my grandpa started mining here for specimens in 1977. Go ahead and click, Alex. So you can see it's centered right there. Oh, you're fine. Go to the next one right in the center of Colorado. Here's a map. So to the east side of the picture there, that's the town of Alma. Um, Alma is very near Fair Play. And you take the little road up Buckskin Gulch towards the Sweet Home, which is on the uh, east side of the gulch facing south, um, right there on Mount Bross. And I mean, you're mining, well, the Sweet Home lies just below tree line. Um, it's, it's, way up there in elevation. Um, the mining season is fairly short because of the amount of snowfall that they get. And it is uh, really scenic up there. If anybody's ever been to central Colorado, you know what the mountains look like there. It's a, it's a beautiful spot. All right, next. So this is what the sweet home looked like in 1977. There's the mine building um, in the background in the center and, or, and the mine buildings on the left, the portals in the center. This is my dad's photograph when they started in the summer. Next slide. This is the photo of the portal. There's uh, Mount Bross in the background there. This is from the MR. No, it's okay, go to the next one. This is a shot of Mount Democrat when you're looking across Buckskin Creek from the Sweet Home. So you'd be essentially be standing in front of the Sweet Home looking to the west. 
from 1977 here. So there's my dad in his mine gear in the portal. They had just reopened the mine. They, they uh, acquired the lease from the mine owner and went straight to work. Next slide is a shot of my grandfather. That's Dave Bergman right there. Um, for those of you who own a copy of Peter Bancroft's Gem and Crystal Treasures, that black and white photo of my grandfather is in the book in the Sweet Home chapter. Uh, it's the only published photo of my grandfather. It was in the MR and in Bancroft's book. Um, interesting tidbit of history. When, when Bancroft's book came out originally, there was a competition amongst a lot of collectors to try to get autographs from all the people pictured in the book. And my grandfather happened to be in Tucson that year and didn't realize the competition was going until somebody brought him the book and asked for his signature. And he thought it was a little strange. My, my grandfather's very... Um, I don't know. He's a very down to earth kind of guy. He doesn't know anything about celebrity. And he, he signed the book and asked what it was for. And they told him about the competition. And he said, um, well, I didn't realize this was a competition. And he said, well, guess what? I, I'm only going to sign your book. I'm not going to sign anybody else's to give you a leg up on all of it. Funny thing about that photo, that is completely staged. If you were mining, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have one leg propped up with the drill there that was completely staged in order to you know create dramatic effect it was my dad's idea to have him st stand up on one leg like that but that's not the way you operate the drill okay next slide so this was arguably um the finest rhodochrosite specimen to come out of the sweet home prior to the material found by uh, Brian Lee's and Collector's Edge for decades. Um, this is a nearly, well, it's actually closer to six inches. I know it says five inches in the caption there. Um, this piece, my grandfather is the one who took it out of the mine. They said when they found it, it was sitting in a pocket and glowing blood red, and it was completely transparent, totally water clear. And moments after they actually opened the pocket and exposed it to the outside environment in the air, it started to turn kind of milky and translucent, but it still remains uh, that deep red color. Um, probably not clean enough to facet stones. We'll get into that in a second, but this is the signature piece that they took out of the mine. It's really hard for them to get things on Matrix. They didn't have the luxury of the diamond tip chip uh, diamond tipped chainsaws, so they were always taking stuff out as singles typically, and uh, when they did blasts, a lot of stuff just came off the rock. You have a very soft mineral in rhodochrosite, and it grows on a very hard granodiorite host rock, and it's really hard to keep those crystals on there back in the day. All right, next slide. So this one came out. This is about a three-inch specimen. This is one of the first pockets that they opened up. They didn't find a lot of stuff on quartz, but they did find a lot associated with fluorite. So you can see here, big jemmy red roms with purple fluorite and a little bit of sphalerite and galena mixed in at the bottom. But the center of that crystal is hard to see in the photo, but it's nearly water clear. And if we go to the next piece, this one's a bit more obvious. Same thing here. You have the sulfides and the quartz, but in the back there, those are nearly transparent rhodochrosite crystals on this miniature. So if we go to the next slide, here's some of the things that came out. And these are large rhodochrosite gems, you know, several approaching 20 carats. Um, these were all faceted um, in the late 70s and early 1980s by a guy named Mitch Abel, who used to be a mineral dealer. It lives down in Phoenix now. But um, for those who don't know, rhodochrosite not only soft, but has perfect cleavage in several directions. And it's really difficult to facet. Uh, stones tend to fall apart a lot or they'll just cleave or explode when they're on the, the lap. So to get stones with a high polish and good sharp meats on the facets is incredibly rare. All four of these stones are in our private collection, by the way, these all came out um, from the mining that my dad and my grandfather did. Okay. So we're going to move on here. I, I have to show this because it has nothing to do with gems, but it is a signature rhodochrosite from Colorado. It's not from the Sweet Home. It's actually from a place called the Mickey Breen Mine, which is part of the Mountain Monarch in Uray, Colorado, which is my mom's hometown. Uh, we have used this as a logo for our business for decades. Um, it's actually as good of a single ROM of rhodochrosite for 
any mine you'll ever see in Colorado. But there was literally only one pocket that produced these crystals. And this piece was the best specimen that came out of there. Um, actually, there wasn't even really a close number two. There was this piece and that was it. It is cherry red, razor sharp, very gemmy. And it honestly looks a lot better in person than the photos might indicate. Okay, so our next slide will show faceted rhodochrosite from the Urad mine. Now, the Urad is actually a molybdenum producer, and it's over, if, if you take Highway 40 off of I-70 west of Denver towards the town of Empire, that's where the Urad mine is. Um, it's on the way past uh, Fraser Pass, if anybody knows that area. Um, it's the northeast end of what is essentially uh, near the Continental Divide, but they did produce really good gem quality rhodochrosites. You can see this guy here is over 11 and a half carats and at faceted rhodochrosite, gem quality at least, anything over two or three carats is a big deal. And to have stones, you know, more than 10, 11, 15 carats is magnificent. Um, this, to the best of my knowledge, is the largest faceted roto from the Urad ever found. Okay, uh, continuing with the sweet home here, people know that there's fluorite, but people don't typically see faceted material. Uh, this actually came out of an area at the front of the mine on the Colorado level when they were working in 1977. And you can see the beautiful green and purple banding in there. Um, this stone is a little over four carats. Um, fluorite, again, like rhodochrosite, soft material, perfect cleavage in several directions, but if you can get a good polish on it and really make sharp meats on the facets, this is what it looks like. Okay, Alex, let's move on. We're gonna move on now to the Lake George, Crystal Creek, Park and Teller County areas. So as the crow flies, it's actually not very far from where the sweet home is, but it is a dramatically different environment. We are gonna start dealing with pegmatite material here. So moving on, next slide. Um, this was probably the first marketed area in Colorado for gem mining, and it was specifically gem mining. And it wasn't just rocks and minerals. They had fossils and petrified wood and all sorts of things in this area to open to the public for collecting. This postcard, um, A.B. Whitmore was a famous Colorado miner and promoter. Um, this postcard dates back to, I want to say about the 1930s. Um, and Pikes Peak was probably the most famous area in Colorado for tourism. And people really tried to capitalize on all of the, uh, the, the mining. It's not really the right word for it, mining. It was basically digging holes in the ground. The majority, well, actually back then, believe it or not, the majority of what they found was strictly on the surface. Um, when my dad first moved to Colorado to dig Amsonite, he met a local collector by the name of Clarence Coyle, who you'll see here shortly. And he told Clarence he wanted to start digging for Amsonite. And Clarence was outraged and said, what do you mean? I've been walking around picking this stuff up. And you said, you wanna start digging for it now? I don't wanna put in that kind of effort for Amsonite. Luckily, they did start digging and they found some good stuff. But for a long time, they would bring people to do these tours and to dig essentially maybe, I don't know, a foot into the ground and they'd find stuff all over the place. You can't imagine the thousands of pounds of amsonite, smoky quartz, topaz, all sorts of fluorite, good material that they found. Um, and Pikes Peak was at the center of it. All right, so our next card we'll show here. This is the actual gem mine. So this is Jerry Harianic, um, Slattery, Bradbury, A.B. Whitmore, and Mr. M.H. Brown. These are the guys responsible for putting this area on the map. 1935, they were at uh, key figures in not only promoting this to tourism, but actually turning this into something, something marketable as a signature for Colorado. All right, next slide. So there's Clarence. This is my dad's former digging partner for Amsonite. Um, Clarence was a legendary figure in Colorado. He knew the, the areas around Park and Teller County better than anybody and had a knack for finding Amsonite. Some people just know exactly where to dig. And when Clarence really got serious about digging, 
every time they went out, they found good material. It was incredible because um, for those who don't know, my, my dad became uh, disabled in the early 1980s and really didn't leave the house much after that. So in about a decade's time from 1970 to about 1980, he really accomplished a lot in terms of collecting around Colorado, finding a lot of stuff, writing articles, getting things published. Um, and Clarence was at the, the heart of that. He, they were really good friends and really helped my dad find the majority of the good Amsonite that he came out for. That was originally the reason he came out here. He wanted to find Amsonite. Okay. So if you look here, this is actually a plaque at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. And you can see CG Coil, that's Clarence and O.A. Reese, Orville Reese, his old collecting partner. And they actually laid stone, mostly Amsonite and smoking, smoky quartz, in the entryway to the Air Force Academy down there as a, a, a way to commemorate the opening of the Air Force Academy. They wanted to have signature rock in the walls. Um, so all of that, yes, they call it semi-precious stone. Um, Yes, quartz and feldspar are obviously not precious by any means. Unfortunately, it's a black and white photo. You can't see it very well in terms of the color. But if any of you ever visit Colorado Springs, go to the Air Force Academy. It's really fun to see the way that it's all laid into the entryway there. Okay, next slide. So here's, again, uh, another black and white shot. But basically, that mosaic, all those little tiles in there are amsonite and smoky quartz you know it says here 5,000 square inches of polished material um, at the air force academy chapel um, this is what you'll see in almost every rock shop in colorado all over the place is just tumbled polished pieces of smoky quartz and amsonite because there were thousands and thousands of pieces of it and it really was what attracted people to this area for a long time okay moving on so you could see the rich blue, people call it blue, I think it's more green no matter what, but people call this the best blue color Amsonite found anywhere in Colorado. This is from what they called the Reeser mine. It was technically the Reeser claim, June 1970. So this was right after my dad arrived in Colorado. And this stuff was as saturated and impossible to replicate in the photos. The color is so intense and beautiful. Um, people used to think it was actually dyed. It was so unlike any Amsonite that anybody had seen, um, but there was a purity all the way through. It wasn't just a surface coating or go down a few millimeters. That's why we show the bottom of the specimen so you can see that it's solid blue green all the way through. So if we look to the next slide here, you can see that, yeah, this stuff is found with Smoky Quartz, this combination is iconic for Colorado. Um, the Amsonites on here are actually slightly translucent. They have a little bit of gemminess to them, but the black and green together. This is from my dad's famous Yucca Hill claim. You guys might have seen this kind of material on the market, you know, going back decades. If you go on Mindat, we've posted lots of these pieces on there. This is the most productive claim that my dad and Clarence had together out in the Lake George area. Okay. So you can see how nice this material polishes up. Gem quality Amsonite, when you polish it correctly, is as good as anything on the market. This is nearly a hundred carat stone. Uh, a good friend of our family polished this one. His name is Robert Heath. Um, I, I love this material for the simple fact, if you look at um, some Brazilian Amsonite or even the stuff from Russia will have these veinlets of white feldspar trapped inside, but the purity and the consistency, especially in a nearly 100 carat stone like this is tremendous. Uh, okay, next slide. You can see that this material does really well in jewelry. It's durable. It holds up nicely. Uh, we This piece actually belonged to my grandfather. It's set in an old sterling silver bezel, a um, little over an inch tall, just under an inch wide. Um, again, the same quality, but this stone was mined decades before my dad even arrived in Colorado. Uh, the majority of these crystals that you'll find that are polished are typically cleavage sections. Microcline has perfect cleavage in one direction. And a lot of people don't realize this, but they, they'll look at certain faces on microcline and think it's actually a termination when it's a, a pure cleavage face. So you have to look closely on this. But if you polish just off the cleavage, you get some really high gloss on these stones. Okay, next slide. 
Uh, the other mineral that a lot of people don't think about from this area is fluorite, gem quality fluorite and crystals that I've seen individual crystals from Lake George that are nearly a foot across. Now they're kind of crude, but they get big and they're gem quality and they come in all kinds of colors. There's blue, there's green. I've seen pink. I've seen kind of a smoky purple color um, and it's beautiful material. But for a long time, nobody did much with it because it wasn't always well crystallized. Huge gem sections, but it was kind of lumpy. So my dad had the brilliant idea decades ago. Go to the next slide. You can see what this stuff looks like when it's faceted. Now, this stone was cut by Kevin Ringer, who used to work with Dudley Blowett from Mountain Minerals International, and he was an expert at cutting soft material. But you can see this soft crystal green color inside of here, completely transparent, this is a modified Portuguese round, over 16 carats. And as nice as this photo looks, the stone's even better in person. Good faceted fluorite is really, really pretty when it's done correctly. The next stone here was actually cut by my brother. Um, this is an almost 50 carat fluorite, completely transparent from a piece of rough that my dad found years ago that was literally lying in a flat, didn't even have a label on it or anything. And it was, it was broken on all sides. It was just a chunk, but there was this huge gem section in the middle of it. Um, for th those who don't know, your average yield on a piece of rough is approximately 20 percent so the piece of rough started out at least 250 carats if not larger to produce a stone like this okay moving on um we have gem fenakite in colorado this is the best one in our collection I, I know this is a personal favorite for alex because it came from the smithsonian it was actually part of carl bosch's collection uh we have the original bosch label that goes with the piece uh the crystal itself is 1.7 centimeters across it is nearly water clear there's a little bit of murkiness in there but gem quality fenakite is only found from a few places in the world uh, of this caliber. And even though we have phenakites from Mount Antero, they're never transparent like this guy here. Okay, moving on. So now we're gonna go just a little bit north into the Terriol Mountains, the Devil's Head area, Glen Cove, which is closer to Pikes Peak. Um, this is in between Denver and Colorado Springs, a little bit to the west. But again, you can see as the crow flies, very close to Alma and fair play for the sweet home and not that far north of where the Amazonites come from. I mean, I can get to this area in an hour and a half from my house from Denver. Okay, so we will show, oh, okay. So that arrow's for Devil's Head and then the next arrow will be for uh, the Glen Cove area or maybe Glen Cove is, oh no, that's Glen Cove, that last one there, that's Glen Cove to the south, okay. So this is what the Terriols look like. There's Devil's Head area on the left. And the third image on the bottom right are the famous Topaz Spires. Uh, for those of you who know the name Edwin Over, he collected a lot in the American West. And he was actually the guy who discovered these Topaz Spires, uh, these thin rock protrusions that actually contained these narrow pockets of topaz crystals, um, almost like a lens shape. But and all the topaz crystals were loose singles, floaters, essentially, a lot of them were doubly terminated floaters. Uh, but they were extremely difficult to collect because you had to climb up sometimes 20, 30, 40, 50 feet, and literally just try to jam your hand inside of these small openings and pull out whatever crystals were inside. Okay. So if we move on here, you can see this is a fairly uh, detailed map of what we typically call the Terriols, but it consists of Devil's Head and Deckers is up there. Buffalo Creek produces stuff. And then if you look a little further south, there's Crystal Peak and Florissant, Lake George and Cripple Creek down there. But all of this area is filled with gem pegmatites. Um, predominantly, people are looking for topaz, but there's really good quality quartz in there and fluorite and uh, we'll focus on the gem material here okay alex so if we move on you can see we have 
really nice, good gem blue topaz from this area. This is part of our private collection. That is a large box buster thumbnail on, on the left. And the stone on the right is nearly five carats. That was faceted by my brother, by Brett Cosner of Cosner Gem Co. This material is naturally uh, blue. It's not treated or irradiated. But the interesting thing about it is some topaz will lose its color in sunlight. But these blue crystals from the terrials, they actually darken a bit when you put them in sunlight. Um, they don't hold their color, but you can take a lighter blue terrial topaz, put it in the sun, and it will darken and stay like that, sometimes for a couple of weeks. But um, I actually have one in the windowsill in our kitchen, and it stays a nice medium blue all the time because of the amount of sunlight it absorbs. OK, so this piece here is one of my favorite specimens in the collection. This is what is known as a true rough and cut. So the crystal on the left and the stone on the right were actually part of the same piece. Um, we'll get a little further in in just a second here and you can see the process by which this became the rough and the cut. Um, you can see at the base of the crystal it's contacted, broken apart, um, but there was a large gem section in the in the lower area. It was completely water clear. So that piece was actually cleaved off of the bottom and used to facet this giant 177 carat gem on the right. So if we go to the next slide, you can see this was another rough and cut set done in the same exact way. But this one is a little bit different because this is actually a combination of blue topaz and natural sherry colored topaz within the same entity. So you can see the difference in color in the crystal and in the stone here. And that stone was also taken out of the lower section of the crystal. This is this is how rough and cuts were done for a long time. They would take single gem crystals, break off a section and facet a stone from them. That's where rough and cuts originally came from. Okay, so we will show, oh, and the devil's head topaz is typically always either colorless or a very pale sherry color. This is a Portuguese round cut by my brother. This is actually one of the first stones he cut. Um, eight carats, you can see there's a little bit of inclusions in there. Almost all the devil's head stuff is just slightly included, but the color is really pretty when you get a slightly larger stone, that soft sherry color, uh, reminiscent of stuff you would see from the, uh, the, the mountains in Utah, the, the Wawas. Okay, moving on. So this was the photograph of the first rough and cut that we saw. You can see that bright line in the center of the crystal. That's where the cleavage runs. And the bottom of the crystal was cleaved off. And that's where the large stone came from. So if you go to the next slide, Alex, you can see there. The bottom has been cleaved off at the top. This is an old photo. This was, oh probably 40 years ago, early 1980s, I want to say. And then if we go to the slide after this, you'll see, oh, there we go. There's the, the finished product on this one. The first one and the last one were actually two different pieces. So this one is the one that we just saw. The other one was, I, I, I'm sorry, I did these out of order. So this one also, a true rough and cut here with the 477 carat crystal and the 47 carat cut stone at the base. Um, they match perfectly in shape, in size, in color. They complement one another beautifully. Um, now, Glen Cove is not part of the Terrials. It's actually a locality specifically on Pikes Peak, but it shares the, the same geologic environment as the Terrials. It just carries over into there. Um, some of these rocks, by the way, in the Pikes Peak Batholit are 1.01 billion years old. And these topaz crystals have been sitting in there in sometimes perfect condition for a very long time. It's amazing how, how well preserved they are. OK, so the next slide, we are going to move to Mount Antero, a place that most people know for some of the best natural blue aquamarine in North America. Outside of places like Brazil and Pakistan, you don't see this blue of aquamarine. Well, I guess the Arango area now um, in Namibia. But these, these were famous for a long time. Um, Mount Antero is actually very close to the highway. If you take Highway 285 south out of Denver or Highway 24 south out of uh, Leadville off of I-70, 
if you go just a little west of there, you have what's called the collegiate range with places like Mount Harvard and Mount Princeton and Mount Antero is in there as well. Once you, you can actually see Mount Antero very clearly from the highway, but once you start driving up there, it takes a long time. It takes several hours through very tight, winding, nasty terrain to get up there. And the mining is often done very near the peak, well above tree line and on a completely exposed bald mountain face. As a matter of fact, I've been up on Mount Antero in the summer on a clear sunny day and moments later, I, it almost feels supernatural. The sky turns completely black, there's lightning all around you and a storm will just show up out of nowhere. And then 10 minutes later, it's gone and it's back to being sunny and clear again. It's, it's a crazy place to go collect. So if we go to the next slide, you can see, this is what Mount Antero looks like from looking from the east and looking from the west. Um, it's 14,000 feet and loaded with more good gem aquamarine than almost anybody can imagine. Uh, it's not easy mining. Um, the majority of it has to be done by hand in very hard, solid granite. But some of the stuff that comes out of there is world class. Um, some of you might have seen Brian Lees has often displayed a specimen that came out of Mount Antero several years ago. It almost has like a, a rabbit ear set of crystals that are just the deepest steel blue color and completely water clear with smoky quartz and feldspar. It's a beautiful combination specimen. Um, you wouldn't actually believe it's from Colorado because things like that typically don't even come out of Mount Antero. Okay. So if we move on, you can see this is from the famous mud pocket. It's known to a lot of collectors in Colorado because it was literally a bunch of decomposed feldspar inside the pocket that had obviously a bunch of rainwater went in there and turned it all into mud. It was pocket clay that became wet, but there were literally hundreds of these beautiful water clear gem aquamarine crystals that came out. The majority of them were between one and two inches. There was a few over three or four inches, uh, but they were completely transparent. It, it's hard to tell from this photo, but that crystal is like glass. There is literally complete transparency all the way through. So if we move on to the next one, you can see, there we go. So this actually was collected by Ed Over, the same guy I was talking about collecting in the Topaz Spires in 1938. And this was typical, um, not just for Mount Antero back then, but throughout the years. Um, it's not easy to find really well-terminated crystals, but the gem material inside is what makes them so special. Yeah, they're thin, narrow prisms, but this one, just like the previous crystal, is completely water clear. Okay, so if we move on, you can see this is another one collected by Ed Over. Again, this crystal is just barely over an inch, but it is completely transparent. Really, and, and that blue color is actually a bit more saturated in person. So if we move on to the next slide, you can see this is this piece is actually from Mount White, which is the neighboring mountain to Antero, but it's nearly eight carats. And eight carats might not sound big on a worldwide scale when it comes to aquamarine, but that's a very good sized stone from central Colorado. Okay, so as we move on here, here's another one from Mount White in our private collection. This is 4.7 carats. It's a softer blue color. It's not colorless. It might look a little bit colorless in the photos, but this is what they look like uh, typically when they're faceted. They lose a little bit of that saturation. What's important to note about this stone is that it's almost a complete square emerald, which means that the piece of rough that this was faceted from was much thicker and more equant than the majority of the crystals found at this locality. You'll You'll typically see very narrow elongated stones and to have something as broad and square as this is typically not found. Okay so the next slide we'll show here is a phenakite like we were talking about before on aquamarine. This actually came out of came out of the George English collection. I see a typo on there as well and this was also in the Smithsonian. We have the label for this one. Uh, this combination of phenakite with aquamarine is iconic for Mount Antero. It's what most people try to find there is really nice phenakites on the aqua. Um, they're typically rhombic in habit, but there are trigonal prisms as well. And if we go on to the next slide, Alex, you'll see this is an extremely rare combination. So this piece features 
a trigonal gem quality prism at the very top of the piece there. And directly in front of it, you'll see this kind of beige colored rhombic phenakite sitting in front. Uh, the combination of the habit of the two crystals together is really, really unusual. I've only seen a handful of pieces. Uh, before we move forward on this, Alex, I don't know if you have any way to highlight this photo, but this one always cracks people up. So if everybody looks to the right of the ROM where the feldspar starts, you see that little black spot in there with the little thing sticking off of it? That is a dead spider. That piece has had a spider in it, possibly for hundreds of years, I don't know. Uh, we didn't realize it until Angela actually took the photo and it was on the big projector screen when I did the, the talk for the very first time. And somebody pointed up and said, what's that dark spot? And I said, I don't know. And literally said, oh my God, I think that's a spider. And I went home, pulled the piece out and looked at it with a loop. And yeah, there's a dead spider in there. Um, we, we keep the photo just for that reason. And the, the spider's actually still sitting on the rock just to prove to people that it's that it was in there, probably when it was found. Um, I actually don't know who found this piece. There was no information in the collection, but my dad had this one for years. I don't think he found it. I think he must have bought it from somebody. Um, but this is the spider fenakite. Okay, so the next slide, we're going to move out of Mount Entero and then go to the front range into a place called Genesee Mountain. Um, this is literally right off of I-70 um, before you, it's uh, up by Lookout Mountain, if anybody knows that area, it's on the backside of Lookout Mountain. This is a place my brother and I would go when we were young because you could get there and no time from where we grew up and collecting was as easy as you could imagine. Literally a road cut, on the, on the side of the highway, park your car, you walk 20 feet, you're there. And you didn't have to dig much and you didn't have to break much rock. There was just stuff in open cavities all over the place and you just pick it up. Uh, you know, you've got your pick and, and your rock hammer and a chisel and you could collect there all day. So the next slide, here's a shot. Literally, you can see the highway there. Well, that's the collecting site right next to the highway. This is Highway 40, just north of I-70, uh, behind Lookout Mountain. And my brother and I came here all the time when we were growing up. It was so easy and so much fun to collect. Um, the whole thing, by the way, is completely off limits now, like a lot of stuff in Colorado. It was reclaimed by the Jefferson County Parks uh, Association, and they have a big fence up now. It's it's really a shame. It's, it's a great locality. Um, it is a calcic scarn, essentially, with diopsis side nepidote and garnet. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, you can see here's some of the groschlers that we found there. Um, the two crystallized specimens on the bottom represent two of the best I've ever seen for the locality. And the faceted stone at the top is the largest that I know of from Genesee. This color and quality is reminiscent of the Hessenite groschlers from Italy, from places like Valdala and Val de Souza. It has that same deep reddish overtone to it, um, really high quality across the board. The crystals themselves, super lustrous and gemmy. And like I said, the stone that came out of there, I've never seen another one that size, um, another Portuguese round cut. Okay, so moving on. We're going to show you a bunch of different amethysts from around Colorado. It's it's amazing to think that uh, for as much amethyst as there is, there really isn't a ton of really good gem material. So out west, we have Unaweep Canyon. And in central Colorado, we have Crystal Creek. And if we go up north, I'll, we'll show you a place from the D-Day pocket that my brother discovered um, about 20 years ago. And moving on. Here we go. So this is what Unaweep Canyon material looks like. Now, this is a piece This actually sat on my dad's desk the entire time I was growing up. Um, it shows a range of color from a rosy pink to kind of a mauve hue to a deep Siberian purple on the right hand side. Uh, the piece of rough is almost 50 carats and we never cut it, uh, mostly because it was just this thing that was always on my dad's desk and I never, never wanted to destroy it. Um, but the, the range of colors in there, people don't typically associate with Unaweep, but it's out there. Um, most of it was found 50, 60 years ago, at least, if not further back. This piece here is almost 30 carats. And this is as saturated a purple Siberian hue that you will see in amethyst from anywhere in the world. It is like a piece of glass, completely transparent and really rich color. Okay, so the next slide here, 
here's some of the Crystal Creek amethyst. Now, my dad actually found every one of these. So the stone at the top is about five and a half carats and the match pair at the bottom, two and a half carats. But if you look closely, you can see a reddish pink flash in all three stones. This aspect is extremely desirable for amethyst. Most of the amethyst you'll see from places like Brazil, it's a very flat purple hue. But this stuff is, I, I compare it to the Ugandan material that came out years ago that has that same bright red flash in it. Uh, I think it's probably the most desired attribute for faceted amethyst is to have that red flash and the crystal creek material has it in spades unfortunately the majority of it is typically too cloudy to cut you, you might be able to get some cabochons out of it but my dad actually found the rough for these crystals um unintentionally there was a really heavy rainstorm going through Crystal Creek. He was driving home from collecting amsonite. And as the sun came out, he was on one of the back dirt roads going through the sportsman's club area. And he literally saw the red flash from the amsonite in his car because the sun was hitting it and it was reflecting right back in his eyes, hopped out. And because the, the, rough was all wet and the sun was shining off of it everything was reflecting on the ground and it just picked up a couple i don't know 10 12 pieces i think is what he said and this trio of stones represents the best of what came out of there okay next slide so this is from the famous d-day pocket that my brother collected it was actually um what do i want to say d-day is june 20th i i think that's when d-day is he found these unintentionally because his friend um they had moved into a new house in gilpin county for those who don't know gilpin county is the site of the first gold rush in colorado it's way up in the mountains um this did not come out of any kind of an ore body this was actually a granitic pegmatite uh they the my brother's friend they were digging for a new front lawn on some property they just purchased and they got about two feet into the ground and opened up this vug with all of these really pretty amethyst crystals in there. They have secondary skeletal or fenster overgrowths on them. This piece is about three inches and it's one of the best to come out. If we go to the next slide, you can see this was the best piece of gem material that came out of there. And just like that Crystal Creek stuff and even the Uniweep that you saw before, it has a range of colors with a really rosy pinkish purple core and as you go out towards the exterior you can see the darker purplish hues um, the majority of the stuff was not gem quality but this is the best piece of rough that was found and if we go to the next slide you can see this was the best stone that was cut out of it yeah on a worldwide scale it's nothing impressive because it's only two carats and it's got some inclusions but it was the very first reported amethyst ever found in Gilpin County especially gem quality and my brother just happened to be the one who found it and he's the one who cut this stone as well okay moving on so we're going to do a couple of oddball things here from a few select areas in colorado and then we're going to wrap this up so moving on we have um, an appetite here from the devil's canyon in eagle county um, the appetites from this area are well known locally for their superior color and crystallization. And occasionally you'll find crystals that are completely transparent. If we go to the next slide, you can see this is in our private collection. This is a 26 carat Devil's Canyon Appetite, probably the finest one known from Colorado. It is the, the classic color. It's yellow with just a slight green hint uh, overtone on there this stone is water clear expertly cut and it looks beautiful indoors but when you take this thing in the sun it just explodes with color okay so the next we will show here um this one is for sentimental reasons but also to highlight the quality of sphalerite from colorado there's a few places um down in creed they have some good gem quality stuff. Uh, the big four mine up by Grand Lake, but the Campbird mine, the historic Campbird mine produced the finest gem green sphalerite from anywhere in Colorado. And I would put this on par with the best green that you'd see from the Iron Cap mine in Arizona or anywhere in Bulgaria. This is a saturated emerald green. It is impossible to replicate in the photos. It looks so much better in person. But the interesting aspect of this stone and this 
uh, specimen is that my grandfather actually collected that piece on the left there. And it was really difficult to photograph. Uh, we did our best. Uh, it's the kind of thing you have to see in person, but the crystal had a gem nodule on the back that was loose. And because Sphalerite has perfect cleavage, we were able to remove it easily. And that stone was actually faceted from the gem nodule that came off the back of this Sphalerite. Um, most people think of Sphalerite typically as black material, but even the faceted gem stuff is always going to be on the warmer side of the spectrum, reds, orange, yellows. But the good greens for my money are the most desirable and the most beautiful because keep in mind, this is a transparent sulfide. All the sulfide species in the world, there's only a handful that you can see through. And this might be the only one that is, well, maybe wurzite. But other than that, this is, this is the only thing you can find that's green. And I mean, this is a glowing deep green. Okay, Alex. All right, so we are going to close out with the Kelsey Lake Diamond Mine in Larimer County, right on the Wyoming border. Yes, we have diamonds in Colorado, and some of them are among the finest ever found anywhere in North America. Um, we, we've had, oh boy, now I, I'd have to look it up. I'm not quite sure if it's in, let me just check my notes here real quick, um, if I have it listed as the, the largest one that came out was... Um, okay, 1994, a 14.2 carat gem quality white diamond was, was recovered. At the time, it was the sixth largest diamond ever found in North America. It was described as almost flawless and estimated at the time to be worth a quarter million dollars. Then a couple of years later, the largest diamond found at Kelsey Lake, named the quote unquote Colorado diamond, was found. It was a 28.3 carat yellow stone and the fifth largest found in North America. The gem was cut and polished by legendary New York diamond cutter Bill Goldberg and yielded a 5.39 carat faceted stone that sold for almost 90 grand 35 years ago or 25 years ago. I'm sorry. And then finally, in July 97, the company found two gem quality stones weighing at 16.3 carats and 28.2 carats. The 28.2 stone was cut into a 16 carat gem, one of the largest finished stones ever produced in North America. Uh, the cut diamond is bigger than the gemstone produced from the Uncle Sam diamond, which was actually cut into a 12.24 carat stone. Okay, so let's move forward with the slideshow here, and you can see this is what Kelsey Lake looks like. It is kimberlite, the same as you would see in Brazil or Africa or India or anywhere else. Uh, these large kimberlite plugs basically loaded with diamond crystals. The majority of them are very small, but we're going to see, I don't have any faceted ones, but in our private collection, we have several excellent crystallized pieces. So next slide, here we go. We're gonna start out here. This, you're, you're gonna be blown away by the amount of diversity from Kelsey Lake in terms of color, in terms of the habits of the crystals. So this one, it's a third of a carat, but it's a very dark purple color. A typical octahedral habit, um, defined striations on every face, complete floater. Next slide. You can see right here, we have a pair of octahedrons. It's also about a third of a carat with a silvery gray overtone. This one is not really gemmy necessarily, but extremely well crystallized. If we move on to the next slide, gem green, this big broad octahedron here, over half a carat, which is very good size for the locality. There's a little bit of a black carbon deposit towards the bottom of it, but this one passes light and is incredibly sharp and, and well, well formed. This one is one of my favorites. So this is actually a pair of highly modified dodecahedra. I don't think it's actually a twin. And then at the bottom, they, they kind of grow out from a central point. And it may be a third crystal, but the two at the top are very well defined with those uh, rhombic dodecahedral faces on there. Next slide. We can see this is one of my favorites. So this one's a very dark green. If you didn't know you were looking at a diamond, you might almost mistake this for a sphalerite crystal. Um, beautiful octahedral striations stepped all the way down. It's a complete floater. It's crystallized all the way around. If you go to the next slide, I'll show you another angle of it. There we go. So this is it from the backside. So Alex, go backwards one and then forwards again so people can see it going back and forth like that. Um, Typically, diamond is something that most people see in terms of single crystals, and they think of, you know, 
colorless or near colorless material, but some of the really dark ones actually show better crystallization for whatever reason. Okay, so moving on. This is what everybody wants to see. And yes, this guy's tiny. It's less than 10 points, but it is a textbook water clear colorless octahedron. Um, this is the kind of stuff that you typically, that the company wouldn't even necessarily save this for gem material because it would be almost impossible to facet. You might get, you know, a one or two pointer out of it. The majority of what they mined up there went for industrial uses. Um, that's how they made the majority of their money was selling diamond for industrial marketing. Okay, so next shot here, another colorless octahedral group. This one over a third of a carat, very good quality, transparent, um, beautiful striations near the points of the faces where they meet on the octahedrons. Again, a complete floater crystallized all the way around. Next shot, another beautiful water clear colorless octahedron. This is actually two octahedrons grown together. If you look at the top right corner, you can see two separate points on there, but the majority of the piece is represented only on the dominant single crystal. Okay, next. This might be my favorite piece in here. So this is a combination of dodex, octahedrons, tetrahexahedrons, and trisoctahedrons all on the same specimen. It's a third of a carat. It's not very big. But if you're into crystallography, this is the kind of thing that you could spend hours mapping because there are literally hundreds of tiny modifying faces on there, not to mention the fact that it's two crystals intergrown with diverging habits. One of them is predominantly dodecahedral. The other is predominantly octahedral. But the tiny modifying faces on every side, along with the little step striations, are just remarkable. OK, next slide. This one here, again, something about the, the darker crystals produced better, sharper textbook form. This one is, for the most part, black. There's a little bit of translucency, but you can see the sharp, well-defined octahedral faces on this. This is what people think of when it comes to diamond crystals. And there's actually a, a bit of attached carbon on the right side there. Okay. Another one here of flattened octahedrons. Now, I looked at this closely. These are not spinel twins. These are just layered, flattened. It's almost like polysynthetic twinning that you would see in feldspar um, because it's it literally looks like one layer after another of octahedrons stacked on top of each other. Completely transparent, water clear, superb quality. Okay, next slide. This is one of my favorite groups from there because it's not just a single crystal. It's not two crystals. It's actually about four or five intergrown to create this really beautiful stepped uh, aesthetic display quality piece. Yeah, it's small, but you could put that into a display and people could recognize what it is. Okay, next. So this is a classic cube octahedron combination. You can see that there's actually some dodecahedral modifications on the top edge there. The highlighted square face on the right, that's the cube. You move up from there and then you can see that's the dodec, that's the other highlighted face. And then the top left side, that's your octahedron. Beautiful yellow green color. Small, it's only 12 points, but okay, that's it. Um, Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. One more slide here, Alex, at the end. If anybody's interested in learning about gemstones of Colorado, pick up a copy of Johnson Kankis's book. Um, my dad helped him write a lot of the chapters for the Colorado gems. Um, I think you can find this fairly inexpensive on Amazon, um, a used copy for sure. But People, like I said in the beginning, people don't really think about Colorado as being a gem producing state. And there's a lot more stuff that I didn't mention here in the talk. But if, if you have any interest, please pick up a copy of the book. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I, I just want to say, Brian, okay. that was yeah. incredible. And thank oh. you. we appreciate it. And we taking your time to do this. That was fantastic. I'm sorry I ran a little long. I'm looking at the clock here and realized I went over an hour. I don't think anyone's going to complain. <laughs> oh, thank no. you. I really appreciate it. That's very sweet of you. Hey, Brian, I, I have a question. I'm, this is Jim Doran from Richmond, Virginia. Hi, Jim. And uh, have you ever been to the uh, Rochester Symposium? Uh, yes, several times. Okay. I was hope I was hoping that you had been if you hadn't then you know you should you should go but i'm glad i'm glad you've been there because that's 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 an awesome uh awesome symposium 
I think Rochester can be easily summed up as mineral collecting in its purest form. Um, it doesn't have the commercialization or anything. It's just the most passionate mineral enthusiasts all under one roof for that weekend. Um, I, I think Rochester is the most beautiful um, grouping of people in the mineral world out there um, because the show is honestly secondary. Um, I know people who go to Rochester who don't even care about buying minerals. Um, I, I've had more knowledge bestowed upon me at Rochester than anywhere else in the world. Oh yeah. It's been great. I've been there several years and I, I the programs are great and everything else yep. is great, but I think just the camaraderie and just meeting all the different people that are just, just so interested in the hobby. I agree. And, you know, I'll tell you a funny story about Rochester. Um, for anybody who doesn't know a legendary figure in the mineral world was uh, Fred Poe. Um, he worked at the American Museum. He was responsible for describing minerals like Brazilianite, legendary figure in the hobby. The year before Fred died, he was 99 years old. And I want to say this was 2003, 2004, something like that. I met Fred for the first time and I was in my early 20s. And um, he, uh, we had a room at Rochester and Fred came in there. He knew my dad from years ago. And Fred sat down at his age, right before his 100th birthday, and looked me square in the eye and said, you guys have any beer? And I said, uh, yeah, we've got some down here. And Fred sat down with me and my brother and a couple other people and proceeded to drink us under the table until about three in the morning. I watched <laughs> that man put away six or seven beers in a couple of hours. And I, I couldn't believe that he had that kind of motor in him. And, you know, we were kids, we were lightweights. And he had such a good time telling us stories about studying under Victor Goldschmidt, learning crystallog crystallography from from the guy who literally wrote the book on crystallography. Um, that was one of my fondest memories. And I, I would have never had that opportunity. I would have never been near somebody like that had it not been for Rochester. Rochester exists for a very special reason for moments like that, for people who genuinely love minerals and care about the people associated with the business and science of minerals. Yeah, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Anybody else have anything? I wanted to say I really love those old photographs. I'm a big person of the history of keep, you know, keeping a record of all these different things. And I'm glad to see that there's been such a great record keeping. And I'm also glad to see, you know, Colorado's recognition of their history and of their heritage for a lot of the mining and the gold prospecting there. Oh, yeah. Uh, like I said, that was so much of what our heritage was for a long time. Mining in Colorado go hand in hand. Um, like I said, I come from a mining family on my mom's side and it, it was celebrated. I mean, for two reasons. Yes, number one, making money was always important because you know miners didn't make a lot of money and if there was any other kind of secondary income that they could generate you know the the, the term that they lovingly came up with for the stuff was high grading uh you you would always take a little bit out of the mine in your lunchbox and as long as you weren't eating into the company time with it they didn't really they turned the other uh, they turned away and they didn't care if you sold stuff but what really mattered to these guys was having the recognition um there there were guys you know, in my mom's hometown of uray which was a mining town for a hundred years who made careers out of mining that's what they did from the time they were old enough to go underground until the day they died they were miners and that was a very respected profession and it was something that you know we've pretty much lost in this country we don't really have a lot of career miners necessarily because you know frankly a lot of that stuff gets outsourced to other countries but what really stood out to me is i have because of that heritage in my family this archive uh, throughout colorado of all these old photos and um if if anybody wants you know copies of of any of the stuff that you saw in the talk just let me know i'm happy to uh send out uh photos to anyone who wants them for their own uses i mean the majority of this stuff either came from articles that my dad wrote or photos that we took ourselves Anybody else? I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. 
<laughs> Will you be my tour guide when I come to Colorado? <laughs> um, I, I suppose. I mean, it really depends on where you want to go. I mean, some places are completely off limits now. Um, I'm, I'm perfectly happy also to just point at a map and say, go here, go here, go here. Um, but yeah, of course, this is my home state. You know, I've been here literally my family's been here since the 1800s i know quite a bit about colorado although you're always learning new stuff um alex was uh, a couple weeks ago sent me his thesis paper on a part of colorado that i didn't even know existed and i learned something new about the mineralogy out there it was um you guys have to ask him about it because um, first <laughs> of all it's his paper and i'm not going to describe it but fascinating stuff that they found out there um that's that's the beauty of all of this is that there's always something new to learn i've never had a day around minerals where i was bored or uninterested there's always something new to find out there who else anybody i'm perfectly happy to answer any questions hey brian this is jim dorn again would you sure. would you happen to know the a character by the name of pete mccreary no, I'm 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 afraid that really doesn't ring a bell. Okay, um, he he was a member of our club, Rich Richmond Gem and Mineral Society. Okay, and he he had uh, gone to uh, Mount Antero for like 25, 30 years. Really, like every like clockwork every year, and would spend like four weeks out there every every summer. Oh wow! Yeah, interesting. Well, um, how long ago was he out here? Uh, I think the last time he was out there, probably 10 years ago. Okay. So maybe, maybe yeah. a little more than before that, but he, yeah, he can't go out there now, he, anymore. He, he really took a toll on him. Well, like I said, when, when my dad was disabled, you know, he stopped going out in the field in the early eighties. So you're talking almost 40 years ago. So that overlap may not exist. And I might've been too young to actually know him. Um, but you can ask him, ask him if he ever met my dad back in the day, he might've known him. My dad knew pretty much everybody. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, I do want to acknowledge, I saw a couple comments in the chat here from, uh, Matt McGill and Aaron and, oh, uh, and now my uncle George putting this in here. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate everybody in the background. Um, I, the, the beauty of doing something like this is being able to reach out to people all over the place. It's, it's amazing to think that there are people interested. I, I, I don't know how else to put it. It's, it's really heartwarming that people want to pay attention and listen to me talk for an hour. So I, I thank you. Um, you deserve my thanks for tuning in because it really does mean a lot. Well, thank you, Brian. This was incredibly interesting. And uh, no one has any more questions, I think we'll end it here for okay. the, uh, the talk portion of the meeting. But again, thank you very much. My pleasure. This was like a I great said. first uh, presentation for our club, for our chapter here. Good. I'm glad you liked it. Like I said, um, uh, I'm here anytime you guys want me. If you want me to do another one next year, I'm happy to do it. And yeah, I will just echo what Alex said is that, you know, this is our first in our speaker series and kudos to Alex. And thank you very much for organizing this with Brian and Brian. I mean, this is, like I said, our first speaker. So we're very honored to have you. And this is a great way to set us forth on our journey to continue the education and to provide these virtual opportunities. And we want to have it any other way. We're very happy to have you here. And, you know, you always have a place to come talk minerals with Friends of Mineralogy Virginia. And you know that there's a crowd of interesting folks that are willing to listen and look over <laughs> those incredible photographs. So we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you all. The honor is really mine. It's uh unusual distinction to be the inaugural speaker but uh I'm, I'm 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 waiting for the plaque to arrive in the mail i assume you guys <laughs> have it made up well we'll get you something <laughs> <laughs> all right you guys take care thank you so much thank you thank, thank you, you Brian. thank you very much have a good night my pleasure